My name is Natalie Rhodes and I'm the Marketing Communications Manager for the College of Arts and Sciences here at Lamar University. Today we're having a graduate session about our Master of Public Administration program. Our goal today is to answer your questions as they relate to being an MPA student. Our guest today is Dr. Brian Williams. He is the director of the MPA program here at Lamar. Also joining us today is Stephanie Broussard. She's the assistant director for graduate recruitment. She'll be here to answer any admissions process related questions. Just wanted to let you know that your video is turned off and your mics are muted to ensure your privacy. We're also recording this session for posting on our website and this, will, this recording will be closed captioned. If you have questions, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have multiple people on this session today, so we'll do our best to answer all of your questions at the end of the discussion. If for some reason we can't answer your question, Dr. Williams will share his contact information at the end, or you can always reach out to Stephanie Broussard. So we'll go ahead and get started. I will turn it over to you, Dr. Williams. Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Brian Williams, um, as Natalie said, I am the director for the Master of Public Administration program here at Lamar. Uh, so today what I want to do is I'll start off and I, I've got a PowerPoint presentation set up that I'll pull up and share screen uh, to walk through. That's really just so I don't talk too much and take up too much of your time and we stay focused. Um, so um, as I said, Dr. Brian Williams, Department of Political Science, um, Director for the uh, Master of Public Administration program. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about what is public administration. A lot of people don't realize when we say public administration, what are we talking about? Uh, so in anything we do, it's important that we're all on the same definition. Um, because if we're talking about two different things, then one of us is going to be really messed up, or maybe even both of us. Um, so what is public administration? So public administration is policy in action. And we'll talk a little bit about policy here to define that. It is government in action. It is the will of the people in action. In our democracy, we operate based on these values that those who are governed have a say in how they will be governed. And so when policy is created, that policy is created through representatives, um, sometimes directly through the people, and then that policy has to be implemented. Um, individuals who make policy generally aren't those that implement the policy. Uh, so when we talk about these issues, now, the word bureaucrat has always been a four-letter word. Now, I understand there's more than four letters in bureaucrat. That's why I went into public administration. I'm not a math person. I know one plus one does not always equal three. Okay, But in this case, the word bureaucrat, considered a four-letter word. When you think of the word bureaucrat, uh, it's... It's always in a, it's usually in a negative context. Uh, but bureaucrat, though, that is public administration. The bureaucrats, those are the individuals who are implementing or putting policy into action. So um, when we think about these, it's important that we differentiate. So two sides, one coin. You have one coin, two different sides. They, that one coin provides a purpose. Each side provides different things for that coin. On one side, you have policy makers, the elected officials at the local, state, and federal. On the other side, you have policy implementation, those appointed officials. A lot of times elected officials are considered public administration. They might be elected to a position that implements, pol that implements policy as well. So we need to make sure we understand public administration as we are defining it, those appointed officials at the local, state, and federal levels just so we make sure we're talking about the same people. Uh, for example, um, one issue that we have coming up right now uh, that the nation and the world is experiencing, police officers. Police officers are street level bureaucrats. They are public administration. They implement policy. They also have a large leeway in how they implement policy. For example, in the Texas Penal Code, if, if I'm still correct, and hopefully it hasn't changed since the last time I saw this, um, there's very few statutes in the Texas Penal Code that says an officer shall or will do something. Most things are may do something. So they're, giving a, they're given a lot of leeway. And so now that's coming into question in how government should function dealing with policing policy. You know, are the bureaucrats doing what, are they actually implementing the will of the people? And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about public administration, implementation of the will of the people. 
Now, now that we have a basic understanding and hopefully we're all on the same definition of public administration and hopefully I haven't taken up too much time so far, um, we're gonna talk about a little bit about the public administration program. So the Master of Public Administration at Lamar University, it's a 36 credit hour program. Um, right now, as far as admittance in the on-campus program, we're accepting, we're looking at 12 new students starting in the fall. As of now, we have four students in that, that have been accepted and, and are guaranteed slots starting in the fall for the on-campus. Um, now, the way it sets up, Lamar University, we do have an all-online MPA program, and then we have an on-campus program. The on-campus is a hybrid. So the way we have it set up, we've, we've gone through and we've adjusted the program in this last year so that starting this fall, individuals in the on-campus program will be able to take one to two lunchtime classes. So coursework will be delivered at lunchtime to help accommodate the working professionals, those people. So during your lunch break, you go in, you're not having to take up three hours in your night when you really need to be with your family. You can come in during your lunchtime, get your classes Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday at lunchtime. So one to two classes on campus, and then the rest of the coursework will be completed online. So, so that's why we call it the hybrid. A couple of classes on campus, a class or two online um, during the same semester. Um, now what the on-campus program offers and benefits is you have the ability to apply for graduate research assistantships, which are paid, and internships, and we do have some paid internships out there. We partner up with the local governments uh, to provide internships, um, and we work those through the Center for Public Policy Study. Um, I have the email there, lamore.edu forward slash public policy center. Um, you can actually go there and you can get more information on the research that we're engaged in right now. Uh, you can look at what's going on and you can look at some of these issues. You, can, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the faculty and some alumni, but you can go in there and you can peruse and you, you can browse through and you can get a better feel for what's going on at Lamar in the Master of Public Policy Study, pu pu Public Administration Studies and in the Public Policy Center. Um, so now talking about the coursework. Um, the degree itself, so like I said, 36 hours in the degree program itself. In the core course, these are mandatory courses. In the core course, um, you have five courses. You have PA theory and methods. That's gonna give you your basic understanding of what public administration is, how do we study it, what do we know and what do we need to know. Um, and then you have public organizations. That's your org theory. I mean, why do public organizations operate the way they do? Um, ethics and morality in public administration, public policy, which gets to this idea, well, how do we come up, I mean, how do we have public policy? What is public policy? Um, how do laws come about? That'll get into that. And then applied research methods. Those are the five core courses. Now, once you complete your core courses, you're able to sit for the comprehensive exam. And yes, the program does have a comprehensive exam where you will have to take an exam and you're gonna have to put all of that together and answer some situational questions. Well, if this situation happened, what do we know? How can we solve this problem using what we know? Okay. Um, now the coursework can be, you, you don't have to take all core courses and then take all the supporting courses. You, you can take them all at the same time, but you cannot sit for comprehensive exams until you complete the core courses. Okay. Now, as well as the core courses, we also have three main areas that we look at. One is policy. Uh, for example, state institutions. So how, what, what's this idea, this intergovernmental relations between um, state and local government and the policies uh, that are made and how do they interact with each other? Um, in the legal side, uh, we, 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 one of them is like constitutional law for PA, for public administration. It gets to these legal challenges. I mean, what is the constitutional authority of public administration to do what it does? Does it have any constitutional authority? or does that come from somebody else? And then disasters is the third area. For example, disaster and hazard management. I mean, how do you really manage the hazard or is it more about communicating with the public to try to keep something bad from happening or try to keep worse things from happening after something does happen? Uh, but th these are the three areas uh, that we focus on, uh, policy, legal, and disaster. 
Um, so right now, everybody gets a mix of those things. As we add more courses, eventually um, individuals will take more courses in one or the other. They'll be able to choose which, uh, which specialization or which area of concentration they would like to study more on. So a little bit about our, our, our alumni. So what I did is I went through and I just picked up some spotlights, you know, over, over time and kind of where they're at right now. Uh, for example, we'll go all the way back to 2002. Now the MBA program at Lamar has been here a lot longer than 2002. Um, but I, I, I just went back to 2002 because that's all my screen would hold. Um, so Dr. Sean Obrey, um, Dr. Obrey had went on after, he, which he was a city manager um, in Orange. Um, went on, uh, got his PhD, um, and is now the city manager in Woodway, Texas. Um, 2005, uh, Ms. Shanna Burke graduated from the MPA program. She is now the executive director of the Southeast Texas Regional Planning Commission. Uh, Ms. Naomi Doyle um, graduated 2012. She is now the elections manager for the county, for Jefferson County in here in Texas. Uh, chief Hector Flores graduated in 2016. He is the chief of police for Lamar University. And Miss Danielle Williams. She works in the legal department for Entergy. So she, she, is, she helps the law. She's not a lawyer. She helps. She works in the legal department, helping the legal, de legal department with anything they need, you know, so that MPA comes in real handy. So it's not just about working in local government or working in federal government. There are many other areas that you can work in outside of MPA. A lot of people need to understand how government functions. A lot in Southeast Texas, we have a lot of petroleum plants. We've got a lot of chemical plants. Um, they have PR people. They have um, government liaisons that need to understand how government functions so that they can take care of business. Um, and then now let's talk a little bit about the faculty. Um, our faculty, we have, we have four full-time faculty dedicated to the MPA program. Uh, Dr. Terry Davis and Dr. Bianca Easterly, uh, they cover more of our legal aspects. For example, Dr. Davis, she handles like the constitutional law issues. She's a constitutional law scholar. Um, Dr. Bianca Easterly, she deals with like state law and policy, um, the, these, these legal aspects. Le legal, and, and as it says under Dr. Terry, legal challenges of disaster, legal challenges of anything really, right? Um, and then you have uh, Dr. James Nelson. He covers a lot of like the state and local issues, um, the policy, policy formulation. He, he's our policy expert. Um, he, he really gets into these issues of policy and, and what it means for somebody in public administration. Why is it important? Um, and then me, uh, Dr. Brian Williams. So me, I, I cover disaster issues. My, my PhD is in public administration and management, and, and I specialize in emergency management. So I study issues of disaster. And then I, I specialize even further dealing with issues of social vulnerability, which you wouldn't think have to do with policy, but really what I study looks at the everyday policy, that policy that people live with every day, what controls our daily life when an event happens, such as COVID-19, such as a hurricane, how do those policies we live with every day impact and maybe create vulnerability when something happens? Yeah, and it's not to say that it happens on purpose, but these what we call negative externalities, which you'll learn about when, we, when you're talking about policy, these negative externalities about, you know, things that happen that you didn't intend to happen, and well, they're kind of, they may be kind of bad, yeah. Um, so that's a little bit about the alumni, about the faculty, uh, where we're, you know, a little bit about the program, a little bit about public administration. So you can say, oh, well, that's, that's not at all what I thought public administration was. But you know what? It's even more important than that because public administration touches everybody's life, whether you want it to or not. You interact with public administration on a daily basis, whether it be, whether, whether you know about it or not. It's because it's about policy implementation. Elected officials create policy. Appointed officials, public administration, somebody has to implement that policy and carry it out. So that's what I've got. <laughs> I don't want to talk any longer. I, I think I've, I feel like I've talked way too long already. <laughs> <laughs> we have 
question come through when you were discussing the hybrid portion of the class? And okay. Zach asked, are all lectures conducted at the same time? I know you mentioned they'd be around lunchtime. Um, is that weekly, daily, or what? Are they recorded so they can be received at any time? Uh, correct. So what we do, we don't record our own campus lectures. Um, but the way the class will be set up, for example, in the fall, uh, state institutions will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 11, uh, 11, 11, 30 to 1225, right, right at lunchtime. Yeah. Um, and so you'll have either Monday, Wednesday, Friday class or a Tuesday, Thursday class or both. Um, so you can take classes, take two classes. So that gets you your one to two classes at lunchtime. So it doesn't take away from, I mean, you're going to take lunch at work. You come into class, you don't, just don't bring anything stinky to eat. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, this program is definitely one that works for a working individual, someone who's got a full-time job and Correct. wants Correct. to continue their education. Correct. Yeah, full-time job. And it, it, it gives you some benefits over just doing online. You know, if, if you took just all classes online, um, you, you have other benefits that you wouldn't receive by doing that. And, and one of the big things in public administration um, is that ability to show experience and that ability to build networks. Uh, when you're talking about public administration, it's all about, it's all about knowing somebody that can help you. You know, how do we, I mean, on a daily basis, and if you're in public administration, you're gonna come, across, come across problems, issues that need to be solved. So where do you go to get that knowledge to solve that problem? Because you're not talking about just solving a problem that uh, may cost five or 10 or $20, $100, you know, might not just have a monitor. You're talking about issues that impact people's lives. Um, so where do you go to solve these problems? Well, questions are just coming through, so hope you're ready for them. <laughs> they're limited Don't ask me about money. <laughs> so I know the on-campus program, you said there's 10 spots and four, four were already taken. Are there a number of selected candidates for the 100% online program, or is that pretty much just open to anyone who makes the cut, I guess? Oh, well, I mean, if, if you meet the requirements, you know, we, we don't limit. And, and we, we don't like to limit. What I, what I say is 12. Um, I'm not saying that if the slots were filled, we wouldn't take another one. Why, absolutely we would. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, we, of course, you, when, when you're talking about on campus um, and, and growth, yeah. Um, if you have somebody that's highly qualified, I'm not going to turn them down. Yeah. Um, because it's all about helping individuals when, we, when, they, need the, when they have the need. You know? Right. Um, so I say 12 spots. That what that's what we use for an average. Hey, we're look. We would like to fill 12 spots. You know what? If 15 people come in and say, "Hey," and 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 you're qual come on in. We'll we'll find a way to make this work. Good. Um. Okay. Is the MPA program open to all bachelor's degrees, like general studies, criminal justice? Anything like that, or do you have to have a specific undergraduate major? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the main thing we look for is you do have to have a conferred bachelor's degree. Okay, at least a conferred bachelor's degree. Now, of course, if you have, a, if you already have a conferred master's degree, we're not gonna turn you down, that, you know, um, but at least a conferred bachelor's degree. And, you know, when you're talking about public administration, um, the main thing that we look at, for example, if you look at the qualifications to get in the program, um, you know, it says a, a degree in political science or public administration, emergency management or something relevant. Um, the main thing we put that in there is because you really need to have some grasp of government. Now, if you don't, we're going to get you up to speed. Yeah, we're going to get you up to speed. Um, the more knowledge you have of government and how government functions, the better off you are and the less of a power curve you have to have to fight against to to get up to speed um, because this is a graduate level program graduate level courses um, we assume that you have some knowledge um, but if you do have a bachelor's degree that is not in one of those absolutely 
absolutely you're welcome. Um, as long as you're willing to put in the effort to learn what you need to learn. Okay, we have another one. It um, says, so there are 12 courses and a comprehensive test to take to get through the program. What if you only wanna take online courses? Is it a set number of classes you have to take per semester? Uh, there is not a set number of classes you have to take per semester. That is, that is, up, that is up to your ability. And, and I, I encourage everyone, whenever you're coming into any graduate level program, you need to evaluate those stressors you have in your life, those responsibilities you already have. Do you have professional responsibilities? Do you have home responsibilities? Do you have a family? You know, I mean, and then you throw on top of all of that, the responsibilities of a graduate program. You know, I mean, look at, take an honest, realistic assessment of what your abilities are based on the challenges that you already have in your life, those responsibilities you already have. Yeah, you know, because you only have so much ability, right? We, 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 can, we only have so much time in a day. And, and, and that's what I mean by ability. You know, we only have so much time in a day. Yeah. You know? um, so if, if you're already spending 100% of your time during the day, where's that time going to come from? Right. Speaking from personal experience to the person who asked this question, I work full time at Lamar University 40 hours a week. And then I was teaching dance in the evenings when I did my graduate program and I knew that I could not do more than two classes per semester. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just what I knew I could handle and I didn't want to overdo it and not be able to do my best and focus a hundred percent on that. And like I used my lunch breaks for my homework. I did that in the evenings when I got home after teaching. So I would definitely recommend just like Dr. Williams say, look at, look at all of your external stuff and, um, really do what's best for you. You you don't have to be in any rush to get it done. These classes are going to be offered continuously. Um, and that's why I chose to do six hours at a time. And sometimes that was hard for me having two jobs, but I also could go home and do that and not have someone uh, that I needed to take care of. I don't have any children. So that was easier for me. Um, but it's totally up to you how many hours you take each semester. Absolutely. Um, I have read that an MPA is the MBA of public sector. Would you agree or disagree with this? Um, <laughs> what other kind of jobs might align with having an MPA? That's a tough question. Right. Well, the thing is how I answer that is when you look at how public administration is studied from a scholarly perspective, there is a, a, a conflict out there. Um, some people say that public management it doesn't matter if it's business or if it's public, management is management. There is no real difference. And then others would say, well, there's a huge difference out there because when you're talking about public sector, public administration, you're talking about implementing the will of the people. You're talking about in a democratic society versus a private business in business administration that is there to make a profit. Now, that's not to say that businesses can't have philanthropic, you know, goals, and, and they absolutely do. Yeah. Um, so when you look at it, there is a split out there. Management is management. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. And then some say, no, there absolutely is a difference. There's this public aspect, and it's public because the market failed in that area there we want government to do stuff for us but is there a market for that and if there's no market then it fall then it can fall to public yeah um and and and, and I'm, I'm just saying I'm, I'm not saying i'm saying that's what some of the perspectives are out there um and so and I, as i say to my 2301 class you know in in, in government you know it's not about my opinion it's about what the literature says. Yeah. Um, I know I have a question that hasn't been asked yet, but when I was looking at programs, I was looking to see if programs required a thesis or not. I know you said that this program does require a comprehensive exam, but does the MPA require a thesis also? Okay, it does require a comprehensive exam, and that doesn't matter online, on campus, you have to take the comprehensive exam. Um, when you complete, you know, the, the core courses, 
uh, because the idea is that we can see that yes, you can, it's, it's about putting things together, not just about taking a class on something. Can you apply that knowledge to solve a problem? I'm not saying the problem, I'm not saying the solution is perfect because if you look at it government, there's a lot of solutions that come out that a lot of people say, what the heck are they doing? I, I, <laughs> I don't understand, you know, but you have to come up with, you have to make a decision, you know? Um, so it, that's what it's about. Now, as far as the thesis goes, yes, we do offer a thesis. Now, if you do choose to take the thesis route, then your, your two thesis courses will replace two of your supporting courses. Okay? Now, if you choose to take the thesis route, you still have to take the comprehensive exam. It does not replace it. Okay? Because the comprehensive exam shows, shows is a different evaluation than what a thesis is. Let's see, um, are the qualifications for the online only program etched in stone? They are, they, they are etched in stone. Now, um, I, I will say this for the online, online program. Um, for example, graduate school requires a GRE. They have a, a computation of that everything goes into your undergrad GPA, your GRE scores, do you meet the standards? Now, um, for the program, the way we work it is, if you have a 3.25 or above uh, undergrad GPA, then we'll take a look at your situation and you are eligible. I'm not saying everybody automatically, but you're eligible for a GRE waiver and we may ask for a GRE waiver for that. Um, if you're between a 2.6 and a 3.25, because I understand, I was young once. I, I, I know people don't believe that, you know, but I was young once and, 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 and I was in school before this. And I understand sometimes things just don't go the way you planned. Sometimes life gets in the way. Um, so to be able to give you the opportunity still, you know, not to just discount somebody, but to give you that opportunity um, you do have the ability to come in, we'll take a look at your record, and as long as you're above a 2.6 and, and, and in that range, um, bring you in as a post back and let you, and you can take up to three classes as a post back. Now, if you maintain a 3.0 in your classes as a post back for those first nine hours, um, then we will say, okay, you can continue in the program. Okay. Um, if you're unable to do that, then we're not able to accept you in. Now, of course, you can always go take the GRE, and if you meet the computational standards, by all means. Awesome. Um, I know I have a question about the application process. I know that Stephanie can talk on the Apply Texas portion of it, but Dr. Williams, maybe you can mention um, what the program requires, if it needs any references, um, anything like that. Uh, the, the, the basic requirements for the program is to have an undergraduate GP or undergraduate conferred bachelor's degree. Um, and then everything else, for example, um, you know, GRE scores, maybe, depending on what we're able to work with, but we can work. It is possible to get a waiver for your GRE scores. Um, we do not require letters of reference um, or writing samples. Um, however, you know, of, of course, if you're, if there's an issue and this is taken on a case by case basis, um, if you would like to submit, you know, let, let's say you don't meet all of those, but you know what, I mean, I just had a rough time at the time, you know, um, there may be, if you wanted to submit a writing sample or a letter of record, but those aren't required as long as you meet the other. Awesome. Stephanie, I don't know if you'd like to talk about the Apply Texas portion and maybe the continuing Cardinal Scholarship. Yeah, so um, in terms of how to apply for this program, the first step you would want to do would be go to applytexas.org. Uh, you would create your profile and you would uh, select this program. And as Dr. Williams mentions, this program is going to be available for fall if you're interested in the on-campus program. Uh, specifically, if you're interested in the on-campus program, you're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom and you're going to select the one that just says Masters of Public Administration. Um, the one that is 
closer towards the top is going to say Masters of Public Administration online degree. So if you're interested in doing the flexible learning, the hybrid um, program, the hybrid, hybrid program of instruction, um, you're going to go for the one at the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. And then you pretty much, it takes about probably less than 10 minutes. You would put in all your information, your previous institutions. We do require um, all the transcripts from all your four-year institutions. So for example, if you took, uh, I don't know, a speech class at uh, University of Houston, then we will require University of Houston transcript. If you took a, I don't know, a, help me out, an art class at a community college, uh, we actually don't need your community college transcripts uh, in order to render a decision for you. So we just need those transcripts for the, uh, for your, from any four-year institution. Right now, we are currently taking uh, unofficial transcripts. So what that entails is you would actually go online to our um, admissions page for our COVID-19 page, and you can actually submit your unofficial transcripts through that portal. <clears throat> so uh, we can render decision with, your with an unofficial transcript, but before you can actually get enrolled in classes, you do have to provide your official transcript. So you know, if you have one saved on your computer somewhere as a PDF file, you can submit it as unofficial and you can get a, a quick response or a quick decision. Um, but just keep in mind before you get enrolled in classes, you, you do have to provide an official transcript. If you are one of these students that does have to provide a GRE, you would um, you know, go onto the ets.org website and set up your GRE and take that test. Uh, your, your, trans I'm sorry, your score report has to come directly from ETS. So you're gonna have to put Lamar University in there um, as a school to receive your scores. We won't be able to receive your scores, you know, use emailing in your, your score report or anything like that. So it has to come directly from ETS. Um, and all this information is available online on our graduate admissions page, um, as far as the addresses that you need to submit um, your transcripts, if you do it officially or unofficially, um, if you want to do it uh, through US mail, if you want to do it electronically, we have all that information available on our website. Lastly, if you are completely confused about how to apply for uh, this program, because uh, I know a lot of folks have probably been away from school for a while, um, then we actually have a how-to video of how to apply uh, where I kind of walk students through the whole process and I share my screen and I just pretty much go through the whole process. It's like a 20 minute video. So if you're interested in looking at that and just you know staying up on a Saturday night and, and applying to this program, you can definitely do that. Um, and it's also on our webpage uh, for our lamar.edu forward slash visit page. And you can go down to graduate school um, under the archive sessions. <clears throat> Lastly, thank you, uh, Natalie, um, the continuing Cardinal scholarship. I know a lot of students always ask questions about scholarships uh, because graduate funding is a lot different from undergraduate funding. So the continuing Cardinal scholarship is a unique opportunity that we offer our on-campus students. So if you are a student that has just graduated from Lamar University, goodness, I got a frog in my throat. So if you are a student that just graduated from Lamar University, like let's say uh, this past May, and you are wanting to pursue this program or uh, any other campus-based program, uh, this, pro or this scholarship is available to you. As long as you've graduated with at least a 3.0 GPA, uh, you, are, uh, you apply and you are accepted to a campus-based program, which MPA would qualify. Um, it couldn't be the online program, it has to be an on-campus program. Um, and you plan on being a full-time student taking at least nine hours for, this, for the uh, long semesters, then you would actually qualify for this scholarship. It's a, it's a $2,000 scholarship and it assists students in helping them transition from undergrad into grad. <clears throat> so we kind of, we give, you those, we give you those funding supports for the first year that you're in school. And um, hopefully by that time, you're able to, you know, work your way through the department if there's any additional department funding to help you, you know, continue your education. But we pretty much help you transition in there easily. Uh, and that's an easy $2,000 scholarship. And that's um, just available for our Lamar students that just graduated. You have to graduate within at least two semesters. So um, definitely if you're looking for a program and wanting to continue your education, and this is an outstanding program to do that, this funding would actually be, um, available to you. Awesome. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me, send me an email and I can give you more information about that scholarship. Thank you, Stephanie. That was super helpful. Yeah, if I can just add a little to that. So, I mean, that that's that's one of the major benefits of the on-campus program uh, coming and actually coming on campus is you do have availability of those scholarships and availability of the research assistantships and the internships that you don't have with the all online program. 
Are there other scholarship options, Dr. Williams, or opportunities, I guess, within the program? Uh, within the program, is, it's mainly, it's, it's the graduate program um, scholarships. Um, now, there are department scholarships that uh, students in the on-campus program are, are eligible to apply for within that, that are uh, competitive. Um, and they'll, they, they'll compete with undergrads as well. Um, that there, there are scholarship, other scholarships available. Oh, uh, well. we've just got a couple more questions and then um, we may be done pretty soon. But I know right now with COVID-19, um, a lot of programs are waiving the GRE test. Is that something that you guys are doing for fall 2020? Um, well, we're, we're ba basically with the GRE waiver, it, it stands the same. It, well, you know, it, 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 if, you, if you meet, yes, we're waiving the GRE um, along with that lines, uh, but it still stands the same along with um, the, re the um, requirements to come in. 3.25 or above, um, you can get full admittance. Uh, 2.6 up to that point, post back admittance, maintain the standards, show that you're able, that you're serious about the program and you're able to do it and continue on. Well, I know right now there's only one other one that I don't believe we've answered is that with this current pandemic situation that we're all in, um, how would having a master's in public administration play a part in that? I know so much of it is local and state government officials, which is who are pretty much calling the shots right now and, and making policies and, and all of that. Like how would that, having that degree, what would that do in this situation? Right. So with, with the MPA, um, I, I, I've heard it said by others, and, and, and I'll tell you, we, we have a number, you know, I went through the alumni. Um, we have a number of city managers in the area that have an MPA from Lamar. Um, and, and one thing that they have to deal with, because it, it's, it's about being able to make a decision, you know, um, an MPA, because public administration is so broad and it covers so many different aspects it's about being able to make that decision. Where, to get, where do I go to get the knowledge to make that decision and make that decision with the people in mind? Because public administrators, they work for elected politicians or elect, elected officials, yeah? Uh, they work for elected officials. Uh, but with public administration, public administration came about as an effort to reduce the ability of corruption in local government, in government. You know, um, somebody come up and say, hey, you know what? Wrong political party, you're all fired. Well, you can't, you, I'm, no. <laughs> I mean, the, and, and the purpose is to have that steadiness. You know, somebody there that's a professional that understands, public administration understands, for example, local government, how, how to run a local government. Somebody that regardless of political affiliation, regardless of political uh, opinions and how government should function, are able to carry out those, those uh, or implement those policies and be able to implement those policies regardless of what the policy is. You know, uh, for example, in when we talk about morals and ethics in public administration, you know, uh, one of the premises there. So what do you do when your moral beliefs conflict with your ethical responsibilities as a public administrator. How many times, I mean, you know, I mean, you look up, say, hey, well, this person up here, this person that was hired to handle this, I, let me give you an example. Same-sex marriage. Comes out, well, you know what? People in the same sex can get married. It, it's policy. Well, does somebody who's appointed have the ability to say, well, no, I'm not going to issue you a license because of moral conflicts with the policy, you know, um, and, 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 and regardless of what that policy is, if someone, but that's the purpose of public administration, to make those decisions to implement policy. Now, let's apply that to COVID-19. So we need to open up government, okay, or do we need to open up government? How should government function? Now, that's a political question, right? How should government function? Now, government, elected officials decide this is how government should function. It's the job of public administration to figure out how to make that work. You know, public administrators, they're the ones that 
or advising the elected officials. They're, they're there to advise them, well, you know, based on my long experience in this, this is how I would do it and this is why, you know. How do we know, how do we know why? Now, of course, we all have our own social influencers that decide how we make decisions. But through the program, the purpose is to teach those critical thinking skills, to apply the knowledge about public administration, to apply the knowledge about scientific studies, to apply the knowledge of what we know about the world, to be able to apply that in a situation that might not be exactly the same. But you know what? It might just work. So how do we solve the problems that we face on a daily basis that can impact lives, that can impact whether somebody is alive tomorrow? You know, regardless of whether, um, well, for example, I did an interview with the Beaumont Enterprise and, and they were, that, actually they asked this exact question. So how do people decide, how do they make these decisions? You know, how do they make the decision of what is this? And I said, well, it, it comes down to, for example, in this case, local government, you got two sides to it, right? And two different opinions in how government should function. Well, should government open back up? Should government stay closed? Should everybody stay home? Can everybody get out? Well, on the one side, I've heard, everybody needs to stay home. And if you don't make everybody stay at home, you're deciding who dies. Wait, hold on. If I stay home, I'm gonna die because I can't go make money and provide for my family. So you know what? I might be staying home, but I'm not gonna have a home to stay in. So either way, you're so from this, this side, you're saying you're gonna choose who dies. You're on this side, you're saying, well, you're choosing who dies. So how so elected official now ultimately that's on elected officials, but they depend on the public administrators to advise them. To, to be able to say, look, this is the problem. This is how we solve it. And this is how we take care of the people. I don't know, did I answer too much that time? You spoke a word right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, but, but really, I mean, you know, um, I, I know city managers, they'll tell you, you know, well, an MPA doesn't prepare you to do your daily activities. Let's say if you want to be a city manager, otherwise it'd be a master of city management. Yeah, you know, um, it it does, it's not going to be able to tell you. Well, this is what you should do on this day, and this is what you do on Mondays. This is what you do on Tuesdays. No, every community is different. Every organization within public administration, whether it's the local, the state, the federal, they're different. The program is there to provide you with those critical thinking skills and the communication skills. Because if you, let's say, let's say you memorize everything, you're good at, you can memorize everything. But if you can't communicate that knowledge in a meaningful way, you know, um, and dealing with the COVID-19 thing, that, that's one thing when we're talking about disaster and hazard management, communicating with the public, how do you get the public to observe protective orders? How, do, uh, well, you have to understand your public because every community is different, right? Every community has different needs. So when you're talking about issuing, whether you say everybody has to all stay home or we all get out and willy nilly, everybody figure out for yourself if you want to live. I don't know. Yeah. Regardless of the level of protection that's provided in those protective orders, um, how do you communicate with the public to get them to observe the, how do you get somebody to leave the area when a hurricane's coming, when they say, you know what, I've lived here 60 years. I've been through every one of them. If I die, I guess it's my turn. What? Because I'm not leaving because somebody's gonna steal my stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving. What, what? No, it's stuff. But then somebody might say, well, no, it's just stuff. Well, you know what? That's all they have to their name. And, and you know what, if it, got, if it got taken, they might not have insurance. They might not have a way to replace those items. And some things may be irreplaceable. So how do we communicate in an effective and meaningful way? It's about decision making. It's about those critical thinking skills and applying the knowledge that's out there to solve problems. Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and ask this one last question. We'll go ahead and close. I talked too long there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 they just keep coming through. Um, 
but this will be the last one. So how many attempts do you have to take the comprehensive exam? One. Okay. And do you have any idea of what like the total cost of the program might be for a student? Okay. So as far as the comprehensive exams go, you have two attempts. So the, the, the first time you take it, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be given a specific amount of time to take it in. Um, with the COVID, we've changed things. We may change back. We may, need, we may not change back. It depends on how things operate. Um, but the comprehensive exams, um, right now you have two exams and you have four hours per exam to complete each exam, okay? And, it, and you're given a situation and you're giving, you're given issues to solve that. Which situate, which issue would you use and what literature would you use to support? So it's not about a right or wrong answer. Can you provide literature? Can you provide an answer to the problem? Because in government, is it the right answer? We'll find out, right? Yeah. Um, but so, so, so you're given a certain amount of time on, on the comprehensive exams. Um, if you're unable to meet, because it is a pass, it, it, it is a go, no go. Yeah. Um, you don't receive a score for it. It's either you made it or you didn't. Okay. Now we do use a rubric to, to guide us. You know, it, it's not willy nilly. Ah, geez, I don't like them. You know, we do use rubrics. Um, that way it, it, it pulls out as much of that subjectiveness as we can. Um, and saying whether or not you have met the requirements. Um, if for some reason you don't own one of the sections or both of the sections, if you don't meet it on one of the sections, you're given the opportunity to retake that section. If you don't meet it on both sections, then you're given the opportunity to retake both sections. But you have two opportunities. If you don't meet it on the first time, you have, an, the, you have one more chance. That's awesome. I wanna interrupt that, because I had a thought. Um, with, with the comprehensive exam, it's not like an SAT or a GRE or anything like that. It's nothing like when you were in undergraduate, when you were taking 15 hours of English, science, math, history, all of the things that don't really go with your major. You are taking classes specific to this program and this program only. So you Correct. don't have to think about your math class on the other side and then you have um, physics over here. You are just doing your MPA classes. So you really, it really probably sounds a lot more tough than it really is because you're focusing all of your attention for school on this one program and all of your Correct. classes go together. Correct. And that's the thing. So it, with the comprehensive exam, you answer it how you can answer it. For example, if I had a situation or is it something dealing with COVID-19, for example, uh, COVID-19, um, you got an issue. Should, should we, should we open all businesses back up 100%, just let it go willy nilly, or should we make everybody stay home? Can you use the literature to answer that? Well, I mean, we might not have the literature right now to answer that since it is so new, you know, but that's just for example. And, and, and the thing is, there is an abundance of literature. So you're talking about ethics and morality in public administration because you're going to be drawing on your core courses to answer this. Because you got to remember, it's not about your opinion and how it thinks should be done. It's about your professional analysis of the literature. And that's what, that, that, that's one thing that people do have issues. I won't say issues that is challenging when you first come into the program. Um, because we all have, we all have our opinion and stuff. Well, my granny, she did that. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. I, those, those that's out there, right? No, it's a, it's about the literature. It's about, what we know, the knowledge that we know about how the world does function, being able to draw on those, that knowledge from ethics and morality and public administration, the knowledge of public organizations, how organizations, the organ, organizational culture in public organizations, and, and then the basics of public administration theory, you know, the, the different ideas of, well, I, maybe I might reach all the way back to to uh, Frederick Taylor, scientific management, go way back and say, well, you know, if we just set everybody up with, with, with a little cog in front of them and made them turn it three times, that would solve the problem. It might, I don't know. But can you use the literature? And, and it's not about, well, I have to pull from all five of them. To, no, 
draw on, draw on it. How would you solve the problem? Which pieces of literature, which, what knowledge would support a certain solution for a problem? And by the time you get to that point, you should be able to do that. And then that second part of that question was the, the cost of the program. If you Oh, the cost of the program? I do not have that in front of me. That's okay. It, it changes so much for everyone, too, because then you uh -huh. have to factor in financial aid, scholarships, if you have external scholarships that come in. Right. Um, so it, it really varies. Uh, uh, Steffi, I don't know if you have any idea of where that information is. So that information, uh, a broad estimate of that could be found on our website. It's under the, the admissions tab or the, you would go to admissions and I think it's a tab called paper college. I have to look it up, but basically it's like an estimate of um, like in-state tuition, out-of-state tuition. So if this is a 36 hour program, you can kind of, you know, you can kind of do the math based by one course. I think maybe one course is uh, maybe like 1200 or so, and then you would just kind of multiply that out. But you're not, you're, it's not, I've seen a lot of very expensive MPA programs with a lot more hours, especially a lot of the online programs. Like, I don't want to just name anybody, but, um, and they are, they have more hours um, and they are more costly. So as far as the state of Texas and MPA programs, we are, we are definitely um, one of the most cost efficient or cost effective programs. I agree. Well, Dr. Williams, we won't keep you any longer. Um, we'll go ahead and end this. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for being here. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for joining yes. in, too, and talking about the admissions processes. Um, if you guys have any questions that are attending, Dr. Williams shared his contact earlier. You can email him or you can contact Stephanie if you have admissions-related questions that doesn't pertain to the specific program. Um, but thank you all for being here today. I, I've learned so much about the MPA program that I didn't already know. So thank you all for your time. And um, one, you one guys thing, have a great rest of your week. One thing oh, that's Kevin, got one more thing. If anyone is interested in getting their free gift, their free bumper sticker, please send me an email. Uh, my email address is oh, fgroupsard11 at lamar.edu. Or you can just reply to the invitation I sent out. Uh, but I would love to send you a, a personalized little in, um, gift for joining us today. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Well, hope you all guys right. have a great rest of your day and a good week. Thank you all for all being right. here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye.